let's go back in time to where London first began with a big old massive ancient stone. Why is that there? Right by the Tower of London, you'll see this big old hunk of wall that looks kind of unfinished. Why is that there? Well, my friends, this is how London started. The Romans came here and invaded what was once a Celtic village along the River Thames, put a big wall around the area, and called it Londinium, which actually means City of the Moon. The idea was they're going to build this wall, have this thriving city, and keep all the other people out. I would say the wall's not really working because, as you can see today, lots and lots of tourists here in London. How cool is this? In the middle of London's modern hustle and bustle, a chunk of the ancient city still stands. A tangible piece of 2,000 year old history. For 400 years, Britain was part of the Roman Empire. And in the year 50 AD, they built Londinium, which is what London's based on. Along with Hadrian's Wall, the Londinium Wall was one of the largest projects in Roman Britain, with 85,000 tons of stone all delivered up the River Thames, built to last even through some medieval upgrades and world wars. And one of the coolest things is you can tell where the Roman Wall ended and then the medieval one built on top of it. That's absolutely correct. The Roman Wall goes up to where the red, uh, you see these red tiles? Yeah. There are intermittent at parts of it. That's where the Roman bit ended. So it's 20 feet high. And, and, and you look down here, the street back in those days was way down there. Wow. So it's an amazing thing. And the ruins of Londinium have been discovered in stages. After the destruction of the Blitz in World War II, portions were unearthed near the Tower of London. Fast forward to today and Londinium lives on as hip Londoners live in neighborhoods like Aldgate, Bishopsgate and Newgate. Time for our why is that there moment. Huh? The original Roman wall had five gates and then two more were added in medieval time. Those areas were actually where gates were, where people went in and out of London. That's fantastic. There's a history to everything. There's a history to everything. And one of those gates, Ludgate, gives us the name Ludgate Hill. Ah, there's that Ludgate Hill, one of the three ancient hills of London, where it is believed that those Londinium Romans built a temple to the goddess Diana. So add the height of that ancient hill to the height of St. Paul's Cathedral, and you can see why that icon seems to rise above London today. And there's even more connections between Londinium and St. Paul. Remember how St. Paul's symbols are the book and the dagger? Well, look closely at this crest and you'll see that dagger. That's for St. Paul, the patron saint of London. But wait, that's not the crest of London. That's because we're not in London anymore. We're in the city of London. That's right, one more incredible legacy of Londinium. As London grew in all directions to over 600 miles, this one square mile within the walls became the city of London, a separate city with its own separate laws, crest, flag, and ruler, with some pretty regal rights for a city so small. There's actually a different, I'm going to say mayor, but there's a proper name for that. Lord Mayor. A Lord Mayor, excuse me darling, yeah. the Lord the Mayor. Lord Mayor. See, the Mayor of London looks after the 600 square miles, but okay. the Lord Mayor is Lord Mayor of one square mile. And the Lord Mayor has some special privileges when it comes even to the Queen. Even to the Queen. And then the monarch of the City of London uh, has to get permission from the Lord Mayor to enter that original square mile. Oh, you know we have to have some fun with this. In Big London, the Queen can go wherever she pleases. But in City of London, believe it or not, the Queen herself has to ask permission to step from here to here. I promise I'll let her in. So is the Lord Mayor the only person that can say no to the Queen? As far as I'm aware, effectively, yeah. I don't think it's ever happened. I, but I, I, I think that effectively it is. So, believe it or not, we are standing somewhere right now where we can stand without permission that the Queen of the United Kingdom cannot, effectively. I wouldn't say no to the Queen, I can tell you that. <laughs> Now, it's part of Magna Carta, that was signed in 1215 by King John, and one of the clauses of the contract of Magna Carta was that the king couldn't enter the city of London without permission from his mayor. Hmm, Magna Carta. That leads us to our next curious destination, a Knights Templar Church. Let's take a little side trip 20 miles west of London to a field called Runnymede, where back in the 13th century, freedom was afoot when English barons wrote a document demanding basic human rights from a certain legendary king. We call him Bad King John. He did just about everything wrong and treated people as if they were dirt. 
He certainly didn't want to, but Bad King John reluctantly put his seal on Magna Carta on June 15, 1215. While it didn't solve the conflict between the barons and the king at the time, this revolutionary concept of man having basic rights went on to inspire democracies in England and, of course, around the world, including the U.S. Constitution and Bill of Rights. It really is still a part of our modern-day lives. And if you believe in democracy, if you believe in the rule of law, if you believe in religious freedom, free speech, all of these good things that were unknown in a time when dictators, despots, and tribal chieftains ruled their people, the Magna Carta's influence is felt today in over a hundred countries and just under two billion people are impacted themselves with the Magna Carta. All that from one piece of paper, or should I say vellum. So why does Magna Carta lead us to this next curious destination, the legendary Knights Templar Church in London? Sort of a, why are we here? The Templaria was vital in the build-up to Magna Carta and Runnymede because it was King John's London headquarters. He, the Templars basically kept him safe. They kept him alive. And King John had many advisors back in those 1215 Magna Carta days, including William Marshall, first Earl of Pembroke. He was loyal to the crown in, an, in a very consistent way, so that even though he thought that King John was doing a lot of bad things, he was still fundamentally on side. So why is an advisor to the king buried here in Temple Church? Well, because William Marshall was also a Templar Knight. Ah. Surrounded by mystery, secrecy, and legends as the protectors of the Holy Grail, the Lost Ark of the Covenant, alleged Freemason secret society associations, who really were the Knights Templar? They were both monks and knights, so they, were, they had this rather strange vocation yes, to be soldiers as well as men of God. The Order of the Knights Templar, or the Knights of the Temple of Jerusalem, named in honor of the Temple of Solomon, existed for nearly two centuries in the Middle Ages, starting around 1129. During the Crusades, their mission was to regain Jerusalem from the Muslims, and these monks slash knights protected Christian pilgrims on the road to the Holy Land. While the Knights Templar began as following the monastic vow of poverty, they amassed huge wealth and land during their conquests. They even developed their own international banking system. All this wealth, plus rumors of secret rituals and initiations, served to heighten the suspicions about the sanctity of the order. And that is when all those legends and conspiracy theories began. What we do know is that the most honored members of the order were buried here at Temple Church. But why here? And why is their church round? Hmm. In 1185, the Knights Templar consecrated their Temple Church. The round design that you see here is very significant. It was modeled after the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem, where of course it is believed that Jesus was crucified and buried. The idea was that back in medieval times, the Knights Templar would stand right here and feel like they had their own Jerusalem. And that round shape also symbolized the roundness of the earth, with Jerusalem at its center. So to be buried here was clearly a huge honor, as it was about as near to being buried in the Holy Land as they could get. Also, this is where the knights would hold those secret initiation rites. Legend says they would enter from the western door at dawn, stand here in the center, and take their monastic vows of piety and obedience. And there's even more curiosities to be discovered in their effigies. Why are their eyes open, and why do they all look like they're the same age? Their eyes are open because they are poised to rise to their future calling. And they're all portrayed in their early 30s because that's the age that Jesus was at his crucifixion. All right, now I need to know why are all their legs crossed? Well, legend says that legs crossed at the ankle means that knight went on one crusade. Crossed at the knees means two, and crossed at the thighs means three. Next, I'm curious about Temple Church's location. Well, the original Knights Templar Church, called Old Temple, was nearby, atop a pagan temple from Londinium times, just like St. Paul's Cathedral. And there's another interesting connection between these two iconic London churches. Good old Sir Christopher Wren also happened to work on Temple Church in the 1600s. 
And today, you might be surprised at what inhabits the monastic compound surrounding Temple Church, a labyrinth of law offices and barristers' chambers. No offense to lawyers, but you don't normally picture lawyers and monks together. Well, the yeah. Templars were suppressed around 1310, and um, then the King of England wanted to get his hands on it, and there was a little bit of a, you're right, there's a bit of a spat, a bit of a real estate I problem we had. Yeah. Yeah. Real estate problem. <laughs> we did, we had a bit of a problem here. <laughs> but the, uh, but event eventually, eventually, the lawyers of London who had assembled around this area uh, were granted the, all of the land now called the Temple on condition only that they maintain the Temple Church. So, to this day, that's why the center of London's legal system surrounds Temple Church, and why their offices are called Inner Temple and Middle Temple. It's a permanent contract, by the way, to forever maintain the church and its grounds, so law and religion are forever intertwined. So it was already a center of the great constitutional crisis 800 years ago, and here we are at the center of legal London, today. The serendipity that there should be such continuity, yes. it's wonderful. So much history in one little church. As you exit, look up and you'll see one last little, why is that there? Why are there always two knights riding one horse as a symbol of the Knights Templar? Well, as monks, remember, they took a vow of poverty, so they were simply too poor to each have their own horse. <laughs> So, as those Knights Templar were riding two by two to help form the Magna Carta, there was another English church representative there at Runnymede too. We continue our curious crusade along the trail of Magna Carta from London to Runnymede to Salisbury. Salisbury is the home to Salisbury Cathedral, or more properly called, Cathedral of St. Mary. It's one of the finest examples of Gothic architecture with the tallest spire in all of England at 404 feet high. We were, you know, coming along down the hill, you see the spire reaching towards the heaven. It is very impressive, to say the least. It's awe-inspiring, isn't it? Yes. And, and even today, when we're used to large building and grand structures, even today, people's breath is taken away when they see it. The perspective of pilgrims who walked the road to Salisbury in the 13th, 14th century, how extraordinary it must have been for them. The original church was located on an ancient fort at Old Sarum near Stonehenge. Stones from Old Sarum Church were built into this new one, designed by Elias of Derham and built between 1220 and 1380. Pretty speedy construction by medieval standards. And surrounding the church, Salisbury also holds the record for the largest close and cloister in all of England. All of that was in order to inspire us, to turn us towards God. That was the purpose of this building. And so when people come here, they not only see the glorious architecture and the, the beauty of the place, but they also have a sense of its holiness and how the, the prayer of those 800 years has really infected the building. I couldn't agree more. As you explore the cathedral, its majesty will inspire you. Once inside, make sure you come to the center disc right here. As soon as you step on it and you look up, you're in direct line with the top of that spire. And just next to that medallion, you'll see these columns bowing out. As you might have guessed, the weight of that massive spire pushed down on the support columns. The flying buttresses were added later to help support that weight. Then, there's two more sites to explore, an effigy and a statue, which leads us back to our Magna Carta quest, and we've saved the best for last. First, this is William Longsby II, Earl of Salisbury, an important knight during the Crusades and half-brother to King John. He urged old bad King John to agree to Magna Carta. And this guy, Elias of Durham, remember him? He wasn't only the master stonemason who designed the cathedral, he is also a canon of Old Sarum. And he also happened to bear witness to the sealing of Magna Carta. Busy guy. Elias was also entrusted with distributing Magna Carta throughout the country so that everybody would know about their new rights. One of those copies came right here to Salisbury and believe it or not has been here ever since. And today it is one of only four original 1215 Magna Carta. Salisbury's 1215 Magna Carta is considered to be the best preserved out of all four, written in a perfect tiny script. 
one of four remaining copies in the entire world is right here, and it has always been here. How, how did that come to be? That's right. We've never allowed our copy of Magna Carta to travel outside Salisbury. It's been here since 1215. But why was such an important political document brought to a church? Well, the answer is a very practical one. Remember, in the Middle Ages, church and state were very intertwined, and churches basically served as the community centers of the town. So it just made sense to post this new charter where most people could see it. But notice I didn't say where the most people could read it, because remember again, during these times, most people couldn't read or write. So Magna Carta would have been read to them, and the church leaders were the perfect people to do just that. And it's kind of funny because today, you still need someone to read it to you. It's all in Latin. But there's another reason why that is there. What Magna Carta represents, of course, is for all peoples of all faiths. It's a statement of the fact that there is no power that is stronger than the right of an individual to be treated with that kind of respect. It's incredible and humbling to get to see this in person, this one document that started a revolution of freedom. Everybody who comes their way here finds that their own life is uh, put into the context of something uh, that is bigger than themselves and is awe-inspiring for them. So much living history here set within so much beauty. And I think that's what makes this place so magical.